This is not um, so I'm Tracy right? Gershwin, and I'm a professor at the University of Northern Colorado, and I'm really excited that Cadre's here in Colorado, but a little sad because I loved going to Eugene, Oregon when it was there. Um, but it's it's awesome having it here in our my and my current state. I'm originally from California, but um, I have been at UNC for almost 18 or over 18 years now. And um, my area of interest is my research and my passion is, is partnering with families, working with families that comes from my background as a special education teacher. And then as a behavior analyst, um, I sometimes tell people I'm a board certified behavior analyst, but I do it different. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those it's people that time. gets along with, yeah, not every BCBAs are alike. Um, and so, but um, really partnering with families is, is my, passion because what I learned as an early special education teacher is that it, without the families, I, I really didn't have the full picture for the students and I didn't have the partnership that I needed. And I also realized as an educator who had to do my own advocacy because I was not getting the supports and resources and my students were not getting the things that they needed, um, that partnering with families was one of the most meaningful ways to make that happen. And so I'm here bringing that perspective and my colleague here. Hi, I'm Amy Kilpatrick. I'm an assistant professor of special ed at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland. When we submitted this presentation, I was one of Tracy's doc students. So <laughs> it's been a long time coming to get this presentation out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also study family professional partnerships, um, and that has been really important to me through my road in special ed as a special education teacher and administrator, and also working at a state education agency um, in the area, area of complaint resolution and district monitoring. And where I was really seeing these problems are all about communication and lack of trust between the parents and the school. So we are hopefully going to provide some ideas, things that we all probably pretty much know, but it's nice to articulate in a you know concise way, ways that we can help our schools to build trusting relationships with their with the families that they work with. So, and it's yeah, nice. Sorry. Yeah. So it's nice that we, I mean, it, it was as hard as it was to hear some of those stories on the panel. There are stories we've heard different versions of, of families, you know, having to have that strong advocacy voice and, and feeling sometimes like they have to go, um, you know, a lot of extra miles to get the services and, and things in place that they want for their student. And so, you know, one of the things that, you know, both Amy and I come from a background of, of really looking closely at the IEP meeting as one of the initial sources of dispute that usually it's the major, it's the impetus, it's the focal point, it's the tipping point when the partnership can break often or gets disrupted. And so, Really, the idea with today's session, and we want all of you to be participating because you all had pasta for lunch and it's the last session. <laughs> um, and But we really want to emphasize that there are things that can be done within the IEP meeting process before, during, and after. Emphasis on process, not meeting, because I think a lot of people go, oh, it's the IEP meeting, and they just think of it as that one day a year, right? right? And it's not, it's, it's all the time. It's the before, it's the during, it's the after. And so really, how can we improve that process in a meaningful way? I come from a conflict, I'm not gonna do that. I come from a conflict prevention framework. I am very passionate about alternative dispute resolution, but I'm also really passionate about not even having to do dispute resolution to begin with. Or at the very least, uh, identifying, we're going to have challenges in our communication and we're gonna have a difference of opinion. Conflict is likely to develop conflict's not bad. It's simply when we have incompatible goals and ideas from one another. And so when it does happen, how are we going to handle it? So we really wanted to find what are some, what are five key areas that we can enhance our IEP meeting process? And these are the five. We'll be talking about collaborative preparation, graphic recording, student facilitated IEP meetings, 
culturally responsive practices, and then restorative practices. Emphasis that all of the things we'll talk about today are both conflict prevention and they can be used for dispute resolution or even some of the more challenging IEPs you might be having. You might have an IEP with a lot of professionals there. So you know there's gonna be a lot of people there or you're gonna have a really, a lot of maybe heavy issues to talk about, or you know it's been like an ongoing dialogue or something. So these strategies are ways to enhance it. The last thing I'll say about the IEP, well, I'll say a lot about the IEP meeting process, but the last thing I'm gonna kind of go off on it for is, you know, the law, UNC has, where I'm at at University of Northern Colorado, we have a really large licensure program. We have all different licensure, special education, early childhood, gifted and talented, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, um, visual impairments, administrative training. So we see a lot of practitioners in practice. And what we're finding so common is, although IDEA spells out what needs to go in the IEP, what components, who needs to be there, the process is not addressed anywhere. It's not really addressed in our teacher preparation programs unless we really make a point to do it. And I say that as one of a few key researchers across the country who are really investigating how are we preparing teachers on this, but we're not. We're not preparing teachers on how to run effective, meaningful meetings. So without that knowledge and skill set, they're likely to just go in based on their own experiences. And, you know, I always like to say how many of, you know, well, I'm not going to ask this group, but I usually always like to say to teachers, you know, how many of you learned classes on communication? How many of you have had classes on conflict resolution. If I ask that here, everyone's hand's going to be up and I'm going to look bad. But if I were to ask that at an actual, if I were just to drop into a teacher training today, barely anyone's hands are going to be up. Where did you learn how to work with other people? From what, from doing, from watching, and what role models did you have? So what we really want to, what I really want to emphasize is that we, we need to be transparent in the practices and procedures that we do during those IEP meeting and that entire process. So we don't have stories like we had at that panel um, with, I mean, the stories were great, but also, so we don't hear what I turned to one of my um, colleagues that I was sitting next to. And I said, like, when are we going to stop hearing these? It's, I've been hearing this for over 25, like we keep hearing this. When are we going to stop hearing it? So that's what we want to do. If we can put some things in, hopefully we can stop hearing as much and make it a little bit better. So. Right. Okay. So I'll get us started on collaborative preparation and that importance of preparing for that IEP team meeting. I would like to get a sense of who is in the room with us today. So yes. would you just, I'm not going to go around and do introductions, but um, would you raise your hand if you work at the school district level, either building or central office level? Okay, great. Um, if you work at the state agency, okay, a lot of state agency folks, great. If you work in higher ed, okay, hi, hi. Great. If you work for an advocacy organization or parent support network type thing, great. Any parents as your primary identity here? Great. Thank you. Have I missed? I think we keep forgetting lawyers. Oh yeah, lawyers. lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> All hand. right. Is your hand. Some of us. Have You're a lawyer in cadre. That's a different. Row. That's good. That's good. Okay. Great. Okay. So this is the um, pretty basic checklist of the procedural steps before a meeting. And we can probably, you know, think of these pretty easily as just the boxes to check off. But the idea is making sure that our parents are engaged and understand this process and that we are approaching them with respect, equity, communication, advocacy, and commitment. Thinking of those you know, pretty broad terms when we're doing each step of this process. So obviously we're gonna schedule an agreeable time. I can't tell you how many complaints I heard at the state agency and stories I hear now with families that I work with, uh, with, with you know, grant activities of um, that just kind of being the first roadblock of the school refusing to schedule 
when a, a parent can be there. Thankfully, a, a weird, you know, benefit of COVID was, you know, doing the Zoom meetings has helped to open that up quite a bit. Um, and then confirming that date, the time frame, and the location with the family, sending those procedural safeguards, asking if there are any questions. We're going to dig into this a little bit um, more as we go, because that just blanket question. So do you have any questions? You know, that's, that's not really very helpful with communication, especially when a parent is pretty overwhelmed by that process. Um, but then, you know, sharing and collecting any of this needed information ahead of time is really an important task for the, the team to, um, to take part in. And then the um, arranging for interpreters. And I also find that that can really be a struggle and that um, schools can not get interpreters when they, when they really are needed, thinking, oh, well, you know, the, the, the child speaks English, he'll interpret, you know, or, or the brother or the, yeah, you know, and, and we really need to make sure that we've got, you know, high quality interpreters there. And then we do need to consider other accommodations that the families will need when they come to those meetings. You want to jump in? And so really, this is uh, one a study that we're wrapping up. Um, that or that's being published is we did actually focus groups across the state of Colorado and we talked with families about their experiences with the IEP meeting process. This was all part of a statewide initiative. We we now have facilitated IEPs as part of our state department, but prior to that we didn't. And so the Department of Ed and I were collaborating to see before we put into place, let's see what the need is. Let's just see what are the family's experiences? We had Spanish speaking, we had a Spanish speaking focus group. Um, actually, our presenter, Danielle, at the um, she was she was one of the facilitators in it with me. And um, we asked families what what's been good, what 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 has been what practices and or any kind of strategies have made an IEP meeting satisfying to you. By satisfying, you walked away, you felt good, you felt like your student's needs, your child's needs are addressed, and that you know what to do to support your child, and that you feel like there's that meaningful partnership. And then we asked them what, strat what have been challenging situations for their IEP meeting. We asked that question not because we wanted to know. I mean, we do want to know what's challenging about their IEP meeting, but you're not going to be surprised to know that you know, all of the findings of what they didn't find satisfying, we have, as I said, we keep hearing these stories. It's been reiterated in the last 40 years of research. We already know families feel disempowered, left out. There's a lack of communication, trust and communication come up the most as sort of what went wrong. There was a lack of communication and a lack of trust. Um, we did want to know what they what was challenging for their IEPs, but we really wanted to know also what did they have for sick, what did they need? What, what would be helpful for them? And um, one of the questions we asked was, is meeting ahead, was meeting ahead of time be helpful? What is that like? And they all said, absolutely. And when it happens ahead of time, it makes a huge difference. And also a really important finding in this study was what the parents identified as satisfying practices during the IEP meeting were actually simply the team following the law. Yeah. which was scary. Wait, you know, that's really something. That was a really eye-opening. Yeah, like, wow, you know, that's... Thing to learn. It's like, if you just follow these basic steps... Yeah, things and... like parents saying, I asked the administrator to come so many times and he finally came. It made such a difference. And it was like, it was sad because, you know, we just, we were, I think I was wanting to hear really creative strategies and really cool things that people right. are doing. And I didn't, I just heard they're having a meeting scheduled at an agreeable time. They're being able to participate. The right people are in the room at the right time. Um, yeah. And so that's why, even though, even though some of this is, I mean, for this group, some of us are like, well, yeah, of course it's not being done. These mm -hmm. procedural steps before an IEP meeting are those that can, they're procedural, but they also, they also express communicate. They also express a message to the family that is, we're a team, we're a partnership. I need you here, and I want to have you know. We want to make this work. I want to make sure 
sharing and collecting information ahead of time. I want to know what your needs are and your, you know, how do, do you feel like the IEP went for your child last year? And what's going on right now this year? What are some of the goals that you would like to see? Um, my last session I presented on something that I've been doing with another state where we're, we're kind of re, redoing the parent-teacher conference model. And one of the questions we have, the educators and the families talk about at the very beginning is, what are your hopes and dreams for your child this year? And have the family talk about it and have the teacher talk about it. And so we're opening up that kind of vulnerability. But the idea that we're going to come to a meeting like once a year and all of a sudden talk about some of the most intimate things about their child and family without really having that connection or that trust is really I think really short-sighted. It's it's yeah. not. So now here's some of those trust. So stories. so building that trust, um, we are finding is one of the key factors in making sure to have parents coming away satisfied with the IEP process and the the child hopefully getting the services that they need. Um, so some of these trust building steps that we have identified are connecting with that family really authentically before the IEP team meeting, not just having the special ed clerk making a call and leaving a voice message to, to tell the parent when the meeting is, um, but actually having a, a connection and a conversation with that parent um, and, then, and then sharing accurate present levels of functioning and baseline performance information. Um, you know, it doesn't do any good to sugarcoat things before you get into the IEP team meeting and then have, you know, shock and surprise during the meeting, um, but to actually have those difficult conversations. The um, Teacher candidates that I work with, uh, we talk about this process all the time in our classes. And over and over again, they have shared with me that one of the biggest things they're afraid of as you know going into the field for in the next year when they'll be special ed teachers is communicating uncomfortable information with their parents. They are terrified of having to you know, share unpleasant things or even share, you know, concerns with the parents. And they're telling me that their um, conflict Avoid strategies oh. are, is avoidance. That's how they yeah. handle conflict. And so they just don't want to have these conversations. They would rather wait until they get into that IEP team meeting and just kind of have it written on a piece of paper instead of having to have those difficult conversations. So that's that's a growth area for us as a field for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, getting that input about the child's academic, behavioral, um, social growth before drafting goals. We all know the struggle of trying to collect information from the general ed teachers and the special areas teachers and the coaches and things like that, but it is really vital to do. I think schools are starting to do a better job of that, I think. Um, and then collaboratively discussing the focus of the meeting. I mean, we all know the we need to get through the get through the IEP and you know make sure the schedule's down and make sure the accommodations are down, but really understanding from the parent what do you want to focus on? What do we really, you know, what is the heart of the matter that we really need to talk about during that meeting? Not just check this box, check this box, check this box. And then finally, um, if appropriate, sending a draft home of the IEP prior to the meeting. We have to be careful with that. Only if, so what I say about this is only if you've done all of the all above. Of those things. Do yeah. not do that without doing the all of the above. Yeah, no. and the intent of, no, no, a lot of people have, yeah. absolutely not. No, because the draft yeah. has been already discussed between the two of you in terms of, it's more of, what do you want? Not, not necessarily the goals, but I've, I've seen the strategy work really well when educators and family members get together ahead of time, 
doesn't need to be too much of a meeting, but really asking the family, how, how is your child doing at home and in the community? How can we support you? What are some things you're working on socially, academically, behaviorally, emotionally? Really getting to know the family. What do, what do you want to, to have with this IEP meeting? What do you want to address? And then I'm going to share some information. So how do you think we should address? Now, would it be okay with you if I put some of this down as a draft for us to work off of since we've already talked about? Yeah. I like to this call this strategy, how to avoid an adult read aloud IEP meeting. <laughs> because what happens if we don't do this is we have we an read adult <laughs> read aloud. If you've all been a part of that, you know what it is. Everybody's sitting there and the IEP's there and all, okay, I'm the school psychologist. I'm going to provide the assessment results. La, da, 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 da. And then the next person, and there's really no room. It, and I really like to encourage the IEP meeting needs to be a conversation, not a report. So this can be modified and adapted. However, we want to follow the rule, legal rules and all of that. But the idea of connecting so that when you're at the IEP meeting, you're actually having a conversation like this. Okay, so here's what the IEP goal we'd like to see. What would this look like in the home? What would this look like doing in the community? What would this look like doing in these other places? Yeah. So take your microphone so to him because otherwise he's going to have to speak into my... Well, you need to do the microphone for our... Microphone we're we're rule followers. Streaming. It's a live streaming. Oh. So, you know, one of the things that I've heard about that specific issue from districts is we've tried that before, but it, it, what has happened is we'll we'll send the IEP home. The parent doesn't agree, and so they just refuse to come to the meeting at that point. So they're very afraid of that issue. <laughs> yeah, then they probably weren't ready to send the IEP home. Yeah, I think they, they sent they it home have premature. Like, yeah, you need to do that with the if you have a relationship. And that's my alarm that I need to check in for my Southwest flight. So, <laughs> okay, we all know how that goes, you right? Know how that goes. But no, that's a really good point. And so it's. It's really like I just was saying in my last my last session, something that came up that was really powerful in this. We did this district wide training with family professional partnerships. Um, it was about partnerships in general. It was about trust building. And we talked a lot about about a lot about having meaningful meetings and with families. And one of the like sort of surprise, I wasn't thinking this would happen, one of the special education teachers that was trained said, wow, I realize, you know, every time I create my IEP, I, I provide it to the family, all filled in without the parent input, the strengths, the needs or whatever. And she said, I realize how damaging this is, yeah, yeah. but I was doing it because I didn't want them to think I wasn't competent to teach my, their child. Yeah, yeah. So we sure. do have this like push and pull with educators who who are worried and they want to come, you know, they want to make sure they're coming across as competent. But we have to be careful that we're not using our power over yeah. that competence. Are you all checked yeah. in? It's a very fine line. I will be in. Just OK, a second. That, was my, that was my two minute warning. Oh. <laughs> so oh, so before we go on to the next strategy, do you have something to add before we have them do the? No. OK, what I'd love to hear from you all is. If you want to get in, in your groups, um, just talk for five minutes about other things you're all doing within your worlds that are collaborative preparation for that IEP meeting. Any kinds of actionable things. It could be even having family information nights or trainings or how are you all promoting that collaborative, that collaborative check-in partnership building before the IEP meeting happens? So take five minutes or so to share and then talk to each other and then one person who can share some of the things from your groups. <laughs>
Yeah, at one forty five, so four minutes. No, I'm a reporter on a person. The Q and A here right now. Said. But don't That's bring crazy. it. But we're not. I said Jerry Springer. <laughs> <laughs> but I just was trying to think of a talk show person. That's that because I teach behavior. That's the one that came up. I can't help it. So right, we're not going to have. That's not this one. Or Phil Donahue or Oprah or that's, yeah, what, what yeah. I did get the attention. The exactly. You know, talk okay. show person is. So let's hear from who wants to share who Amy's got our microphone. Yes. So I'm going to come to your table. We would really love to hear from each table because there were a lot of great conversations going on. So decide who's going to be the person to share. So we have a mix of um, educators and advocates and, and parents at this table. Great. Um, and we talked about uh, that often uh, families and caregivers, they just need an opportunity 
to uh, have sort of that pre-conversation and organize their thoughts and determine like what are the three most important questions that that you want to be addressed during the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and as an administrator of a program, I um, acknowledge the need for us to do a better job at recognizing the culturally and linguistically diverse families and uh, providing the opportunity and encouraging them in, in that they are a participant, they are the most important participant, and that it is their opportunity to share. Um, and culturally, it may not feel comfortable to question teachers and educators and so forth, but this is the opportunity to make your needs known so that we can address what you want. Yeah. And some of that pre-conversation is, is like, like you're saying, it's like giving them the permission to understand that this is a process that might be very different than you're used to. But I love that you said that. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. How about this table back here? Volunteer. Hi. Um, the three of us are from Idaho and we are contractors with the State Department of Education and we're basically facilitators. And um, the question that you asked seemed to really be more from a district level. So we said, what do we do? Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot through our intake calls and we do a lot of sharing of that information uh, in an honest way, listening to the parent's story and then telling the parent, letting them know that we're gonna share that with the district. And on my part, sometimes I'll say to the director, this is maybe hard for you to hear, but this is what the parent is thinking. And you may want to consider some options to work on solving this question. So then by the time we get to a meeting, there's been these conversations. Um, and so it goes. And we prepare the agenda. So we, mm -hmm. I say to the parent, we, you know, I need to hear from you because I need to know what to put on the agenda. And I'm like, is this, am I hearing, is this what you're saying? You know, is that... I want to make sure I articul articulate it correctly. And it seems to work for us. Yeah, generally works for us. That's awesome. And that's what's funny. Those pretty basic, seemingly obvious some things really work. They really have an impact. Thank you for sharing that. What about this back table here? Who would like to tell us what they talked about? Any key takeaways for passing? <laughs> um, we just talked about the important conversations that you would have with parents um, ahead of time. So not just sending that IP draft home, but actually calling the parent, yes. the teacher, calling the parent, talking to the parent about what they're expecting for the year, talking about those parent concerns um, before you write them down into the IEP, right? Yep. So you don't want to write in the parent concerns, see notes, because that means you waited to hear the parent concerns right. after the IP was already written, right? So you want to have those conversations beforehand so the parent feels like they are a part of the team, mm -hmm. right? And from a conflict prevention framework, that's a really good strategy to have those, com com I mean, it's not only is it just being a good person and a good partner in that family school partnership, but it's also really meaningful from a conflict prevention standpoint, because oftentimes, you know, a family member might be ready to go to the IEP meeting, you know, for example, the, exa the example that was given this afternoon, like ready to ask for a, a paraprofessional for their child because they, they run around and they're, and so sometimes having that conversation prior to with the teacher to say, listen, I'm really concerned about him leaving the classroom all the time. I'm going to be bringing this up. I, you know, I'd like to maybe talk about a paraprofessional. So the school team's also not totally caught off guard if there's an intervention the family's been thinking of or learning about and or a school that they're concerned you know or a placement or an issue we don't want the meeting to be when these hard conversations happen from the beginning they should be having a relationship ahead of time so they're more comfortable to share that exactly would this would this table be willing to share what you all talked about I talked about in teacher education, how we're helping train students um, who will be teachers soon, how to lead family-friendly IEP meetings. And I also talked about that we encourage our students to send home family interviews at the start of the year and really establish yeah. that trust with families 
ahead of time about what's the best way to communicate with you and what days of the week, what times of day to really open those lines of communication. That's awesome. So glad to hear that. that. Thank you. How about this table? So uh, two things that one I shared and one I didn't share, but um, in the Part C system, they have what's called the primary coach model for an IFSP. Because mm -hmm. often we say, we haven't got time to do all this pre-work. Well, the whole team doesn't have to do it. But if you identify a member of the team who is the primary liaison with that family, who's doing that work, it doesn't have to be the entire team doing that. So I think that model makes sense. Uh, the other, based on a model out of Oregon, is working with districts to train parent partners. So I work with a large urban district where they train parents within the district to participate in first IEPs with parents. And they didn't just understand the IEP process. They understood that district and its bureaucracy. That's huge. And, and, and how to navigate it. This is who you call for this. And so they were able to participate in that upfront training for the parents that spoke this morning who said, nobody told me how to do this. Yeah. The districts are training people to say, no, we'll have someone who's understands not just the process, our process, right. help you navigate it effectively. I love that. So. And they own, they, and they're a parent who's been there. So, so there's so many benefits to that. The research about families connecting families with one another, parent to parent support is so powerful. Having families with one another to learn from each other. And it, it makes such a big difference. And it's, really weird sometimes you know when i encourage families connecting i'll hear administrators like well what happens when we put all the parents we'll together <laughs> good things will happen and what i say is listen if you're not going to arrange for them to be together and support them together they're going to find a way and they it will. might not be to your benefit so you might want to if you can fill, facilitate that more amicably you're going to get better outcomes it's it's Right? Exactly. Yeah. Join the mafia. They're going to join the mafia. Yeah. So, and then what some districts do is they'll partner with the mafia because they're, they know like, this is what I need to be talking with these families because they're, they've got this, this mission and this need. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great input. Well, our group, one of them left already, <laughs> but in our group, we talked about, um, some of the strategies that we see districts use and some of the barriers. Oh. And she was saying that um, the lady that left that they have a form they send around to assist teachers to gather information, you know, the, about what are your child's interests. And I know we used to do that in Oklahoma is a practice where it was just to get the idea at the time was to get the parent thinking about it because yeah. parents don't always come in knowing what they're even going to say or talk about. You don't know what you so don't know. Sometimes those forms can be helpful, but we really think having the conversation is more important with someone that they trust, that trusting person. Um, and the barriers that we hear is just the schools protecting their teachers from being overwhelmed and they're afraid it's going to take too much time. Like we almost changed our state rules that they had to give the IEP to the parents so many days. Yeah. And they just wigged out. Wow. And it was because what their response was, they're so overwhelmed now that we're afraid it'll just, they'll just crack. And so, um, you know, we do think that talking earlier at the end of the day lessens the conversation. I mean, it just would make their IEP teams meetings go smoother. Um, it would avoid a lot of conflict, but those are sort of the barriers that we think. Draft. Yeah, they're afraid to even send the draft home because we hear we, I do in my office here. Well, if we send it home, they'll come up with things they don't like about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know it's really God, Yeah. Like, oh, no, they're going to have time to think about it. Let's hit them with the IT when they don't. We're just going to read out loud. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's real. But, it, it, you know, as you go over there, it's true, you know, with this, this components, trust building steps. The most important thing is it has to be intentional. You have, and to have those conversations, some educators do need to know what questions to ask and how to do. Cause as I said earlier, they're not really being taught it in their preparation programs. Well, we had a lot to discuss and I wanted to point out the trust. Um, that is a revolving clock because uh, many persons come and go who are part of the team. And I, we looked at, for me personally, uh, the focus of the meeting should be the functional and academic outcomes for the student, 
in question. And we looked at it in a, in, from the light of maybe having a agenda prior to the meeting, but, um, but letting the parents or the IEP members know that it's fluid. We don't have to stick to the agenda um, and don't just go right into the meeting, um, hitting the ground running. You have to have an icebreaker. And what we discussed, I discussed earlier in another session is having the setup of the meeting um, very welcoming. Not the uh, school team members on that side, and the family members here, it should be all mixed. So I like the checklist item here and we're gonna use it Good. to give to our districts. Good. Another thing I love about that, what you just shared about how we sit and how we position, oh, yeah. I like to really emphasize, go into the meeting together. What I what I've hear, heard from a lot of families is, it's really, it's really intimidating, it feels like middle school, Literally, right. when I walk in the room and there's a whole bunch of educators next to each other laughing and they all stop and get quiet and get really formal. And then you're like, you don't feel like you're part of the team. And and that's the point. We, they're a huge member of the team. Yes, so you're gonna need to take, to take them. Be, oh, um, as an old, old coach, we talk about, oh, IEP team. And what what I my experience was over the years I did this was everybody's on the team, but the but nobody practices together. Exactly. Like we're, we're an IEP team. That's a great get point. Together once a year. Yeah. And then go, oh, well, let's go play. No, no team that yeah. ever coach did that. And it's like, this is team. That's <laughs> That's a mic drop. Like you are holding the mic, don't drop it. But that is like a mic drop point. This Absolutely. Practice. This is practice school. And and going to your point, you know, I don't remember who said it, but you know, I I consistently will say you like go to a productive business meeting. You're not gonna. They're gonna. It's gonna be orderly. It's gonna be organized. Everyone's gonna get a chance, hopefully, to talk. I mean, they don't just go in and go. I don't know. We're just gonna read to you and see what happens. But that's kind of what happens here right but not at google like i'm fairly certain they have very, very good meetings sure they talk things over. yeah so this next strategy kind of on this on this topic of you know how do we make it a meaningful and participatory process so that it's not the adult read aloud one of the things that I really, we really highly recommended, I should say Robin O'Shea with Key 2 Ed was, was going to be presenting with us, but she had a conflict of interest. So this, this, we're, her, this is her, her stuff. Deal. So I'm talking to her stuff, um, but she's very, she's, she's done a lot of work in Key 2 Ed. She's done a lot of work with families and educators and training. And one of the things that, that we've all found is that usually using graphic visual recording makes a huge difference in having a meaningful conversation, especially when there's conflict at hand. So there's strategies like you can do conflict mapping, if you're familiar with that strategy, where you, you take the point to, you know, to something like this. I want to take, I want to ask everybody's what are your thoughts about this? What are your perceptions about this? I want to get everyone's feelings and thoughts on paper. I'm acknowledging everyone and let's problem solve. And so visually representing the things that you're talking about, not only having a visual representation of the information, so it's not the adult read aloud, because I am a visual, I need a visual support. You know, we have this for a reason. If we were just talking and there was no visual, you all would probably have some frustration because you... Most a of us of need that. There's a lot of information. Um, so graphic recording is the process of capturing, synthesizing, and organizing information in a meaningful way in real time using words, shapes, and images. So during the meeting, you can graphically record your IEP meeting throughout. So when you use it, you're engaging everyone by capturing and holding their attention because we're all doing something actionable together. Um, Metaphors uh, are often symbols of that force your brain to make connections and be an active participant in the content. It helps those learners 
comprehend what's been shared by having visual recording, graphic recording, and basically throughout the IEP, okay, this is going to be our goal. And I'm a big fan of utilizing a lot of IEP facilitation procedural practices in IEP meetings in general. That's what I found through my research is that a lot of individuals who've been trained in facilitated IEPs found that having that knowledge and skill set just helps their IEPs run much more smoothly because they were doing things like having agendas and meeting norms and visually charting and having things there so that people are able to see the connections we're having. Um, so you can comprehend and organize things more meaningfully. Um, it helps people remember because let's you know remember that with Memory retention, you typically remember 10% of words, 35% um, if it's pictures only, but if it's pictures and words, 65% of the retention takes place. That's powerful. Excellent. Knowing that sharing, the having the graph recording and sharing it, um, and then connecting. This is where we can connect things. So if, if we're visually charting, for example, let's say we're talking about a student, my area's behavior, so I'll say that. We're talking about a student's behavioral challenges or there's a need um, and there's a goal we're talking about. And now we're talking about how are we going to address this behavioral issue? So we can graphically say, all right, let's draw, you know, this is Johnny at home. Here's what that would look like here. This is Johnny in the community. This is what would look like if we implemented it here. And this is Johnny in the lunchroom. And this is would be Johnny in general ed in the music class, like just put, you know, all of these real specific examples. So again, we're having this conversation because what we really want, what I really want is that at the end of the IEP meeting, the family goes home with a really good understanding of what the school is going to be working on and how they can continue to do that in the home as well. And that the school goes away with a really good understanding of what the family's going on with the family, what's going on with the student, the things that they're working on, and the, the aspects that are important. I said in another meeting, a really powerful um, opportunity I had with the workshop I was doing with families when we were talking about communication. Um, and I should say in the earlier one, I wanted to emphasize, I really like to be very specific. I'm a behavior analyst. So I like to be very <laughs> observable and measurable. So people know exactly what we want them to do to behave in a certain way. I like to say, instead of communication, bi-directional communication. Mm -hmm. So it's both directions. It's not otherwise. We say communication teachers. Oh, yeah, I communicate with parents all the time. I send them emails. I send them newsletters. Are they communicating? But what are you learning from the family? Is there bi directional communication? Because if you don't have that bi directional communication, you're missing a really important part of that child's life. And also, you're, you're passive, you know, it's, it's a, passive way to sort of put the parents in a certain place, right? So we don't want that. Um, I think we can we confuse often the term communication when we're actually we're just broadcasting, you know, yeah. we're just telling and not having that to it. Has anybody witnessed or been a part of an IEP team meeting that used this graphic organizational? Would yeah, you be let's hear about that. Your um, experience with that. Uh, this goes back quite a few years. Um, the the. The child was the child of a friend of mine. So she actually got a, a very full IP team, which included friends and family members. Love that. And they were trying to map out what his life, because he had significant disabilities, what his life and what he what they hoped to get out of his schooling, because I think it was right before he was going to go into kindergarten. So we we spent, I think, might have been two and a half, three hours. But that visual representation was super, super helpful to keep people on task. Mm -hmm. And also, I think from for the mother and, and those of us who are, who are friends, it really made us feel that the child's strengths was being considered, even though this was a child with, I mean, really significant needs. So he would not be a child where you were first see the strengths, but you got to see the strengths the IEP team, the, the educators got to see how they could use their strengths moving forward. And that the parents had hopes for the child and for a life, um, you know, beyond, beyond school. Yeah. I love that. It's if we can bring other members to the meeting, other people who know this student, that would be great. Thank you for sharing that other examples with graphic recording, visual charting. Yeah. 
Oh. So, in general, I mean, these are just good meeting strategies. Yeah. So actually one of the facilitators on my panel is also an artist and she's a professional graphic facilitator. So oh my gosh. She's, you know, she's amazing. But I was did an all day meeting, a, a parent meeting, and they hired a graphic facilitator. And it, it was amazing. I mean, he just he created these three beautiful panels that captured the entire day that then people could you know take pictures of. They sent it out in the notes. It was so much more powerful than notes. Yes. It, you know, I've been reading a whole bunch of text, but looking at these pictures and saying, yeah, I was in that conversation. Mm -hmm. It was really powerful. Yeah, I love that. And that I've seen that a lot with people will take pictures afterwards. So, you know, if we like the strengths, for example, if we want to just go through the strengths, if we're talking about an IEP meeting about Kevin, then we, you know, start with the strengths, you know, he's great at friendships, do two people together. He's great at, you know, just, you don't have to be an artist. You can do any kind of icon drawing along with it or your visual with it. But the more we can help them connect and see that, it's such a meaningful way for people to participate. Yeah. And then that anchor is there for the rest of the meeting, that we are anchoring our discussion in what these strengths are. And just logistically, having somebody... It's, it's hard to do that if you're the teacher trying to run the meeting. Right. Um, having somebody assigned as that scribe role is helpful. Um, we've had parents who develop little portfolios of their kids. Awesome. Yes. And they bring them on the first day of school for the teachers. And they're very visual. They have um, their interests. So they may show him with a picture of kicking a soccer ball. So it's not just the words. Love that. And it really puts out struggles he've had before what's difficult for him like change or you know mm -hmm. and how does the parent support that and I think they're really cool and I think that they I convey that. a lot more information than what is just written in a note or you know I love that and data. think about if if we had them so the the families are doing that think about if you showed up to an IEP meeting for your child and the strengths they wanted they were ready to share the school's ready to share the strengths and they have pictures of your child eating snack with their friends doing their art that is that right there and in in the what families find satisfying not surprising when the focus is on the child everybody's happy right, yeah. we're we're doing what we need to be doing and so that says i care about your child i see your child i take a point of seeing your child and that right there so i've seen families put together collages but i'd love to see the teachers doing it too so it's so great to do that um absolutely okay take it away tracy student facilitator that's why carlos is there that's the only reason why he's here. Do you, want to, okay. do you want to stand up here? So let's, who's familiar with this concept? Yeah, a lot of people are. Great. That is good to hear. Yes. Yeah. Why don't we have you all share a little bit about what it looks like, what it's looked like, um, maybe some challenges. But the first thing, I will say one thing. I always have to say this when you read the regs and it says the IEP team member who's listed last who's the most if appropriate I like to add that too you're right thank you and it says if appropriate oh my goodness why wouldn't it be appropriate it's there it's you know what do they say if you're not on the, if you're not at the table you're on the menu you know and you are on the menu you should be at the table so it but also it talk about student focus. If the student is there, there's a lot of things that come with it with training and such and we'll get to, but the student is there. People tend to behave better. They tend oh, to, yeah. which is nice for conflict prevention. Yeah. Um, so let's hear from yeah. maybe take about, like in two your group. Yeah. About two minutes to talk amongst yourselves, do a little little uh, turn and talk. And so then, share uh, with each share. other any experiences you've had either with student IEPs yourself or seeing other people do it, um, any literature you know about it, challenges as well. So just kind of talk, talk amongst yourselves. That's a Saturday Night Live skit, if anyone remembers that. Talk amongst yourselves.
This is a drive-by quick overview of five strategies. So I'm gonna start on the other side and go in the other direction. And if somebody at your table is willing to share what you talked about, kind of the strengths or your experience, what have been some challenges? Is any, would either of you like? Well, a couple of years ago, we did like a- um, Oh, wait, I think everyone's still talking. Class? Yeah. Okay. Grab your attention. There you go. A couple of years ago, uh, we we did uh, what we call a self determination mm -hmm. workshops, conferences for um, students in the middle school mm -hmm. grades. So we kind of were we discussing how we can reignite that. Love that. And um, actually educating the students more on self-regulation, self-determination, uh, bringing them into the picture earlier and who determines if appropriate, who determines that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a conversation we're gonna take back. I like that. Yeah. Did, any, did anybody wanna have something to share at this table? Any ladies? Um, my son led his IP in the last two IPs he had in high school. We we did a lot of preparation for it, of course, because he would he attended, I think from sixth grade on, he attended his IP meetings, which he thought were the most boring things ever, but he had to be there. And then um, he he didn't necessarily lead the whole thing. He did a PowerPoint about what his interests were. We read over the IP and then he he determined you know, how he was going to input into what the IP said. So, and to that point, um, we hold our, we held his IPs in October. So his last year of high school, he turned 18 in, in March. And, uh, you know, we, we filled out all the paperwork. So he would, he would be an age of majority. And he said, so if I have an IP meeting, you don't have to be there. I can disinvite you. And I said, that's right. That is your right. And I said, but you do realize you don't need to have another IP meeting. So you decide what level of pain you want to go through yourself. And oh. so he decided not wow. to hold another IP meeting, but yeah, yeah. but that autonomy, that's huge. Yeah, that's great. Um, but it's good. It's nice to know. Yeah. Those, those, and the self-determination learning that through that led to that. Nope. I'm good. I don't need yeah. it. Thank you for sharing that, that your personal story there. Either of you want to share your experiences with that? Student led. Yeah. Uh, just really quickly, we were talking about how a lot of what we are doing, though, is about dispute resolution when kind of there's a fever pitch to the conversation. And it's sort of often easy, you know, as a former special ed director, there was sort of a range when it was calmer, happier meeting. It was a lot easier to do this. And certainly when things are falling apart and you're having to fa facilitate or go through mediation, it's a lot harder to uh, sometimes get the voices in well. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously we would have to use some discernment of, of when that would be a good a good practice. A lot of what we're talking about are things that we can do to, um, you know, build that trust, build communication, and hopefully prevent some of those issues from, from getting to that, to that point. This table. Each of us at this table have seen them used in different ways. Mm. Um, we have some districts that do student-led conferences oh, that yeah. are not even, so mm -hmm. it's kind of pre preparatory um, in that way. Um, especially as we get toward transition age, there may be more emphasis on, you know, having, having the student there. Um, and, and we've seen different degrees. Sometimes a student comes and does some introductory stuff, but doesn't stay for the nuts and bolts of the meeting. I've seen one with, with a student who is pretty, pretty involved with autism and, um, a lot of pre-work that was done and had like mm -hmm. a, a table tent with those little binder things. So he could flip pages and it wasn't verbal, but he was able to present the information he wanted the team to see. Love that. Yeah. 
So two common threads that I'm hearing is the importance of pre-planning and preparing the student and having the student have some visuals that they can use when they are um, running part of their meeting. This table, would you like to share anything you talked about? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Similar to what people were talking about, a, like a template so students can fill it out yep. and adding visuals. And so it, it kind of goes like the agenda. The students start with the introductions, then they go through strengths, and they ask their parents their concerns and just all the way through. Yeah, love that. <laughs> template that they can use. This table right here. Anything to add to that conversation? Joanne. <laughs> I would just say we would add that it's great to get kids involved with their IEP, to have their um, their voice heard. Even I can remember years, since like 15 or 16 years ago, my secretary's son was in the second grade and he said, I don't want to do X, Y, and Z. And she said, then you're coming to the meeting wow. and we'll talk about it. Nice. And so that I've never yeah. actually seen one. I've been a part of my grandchildren's um, student-led conferences. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that part of the challenges with that is that I didn't feel during the, the student-led conference that I was getting the information from the teacher that I wanted to know. Interesting. So I, I was proud that they were responsible for their work, showing me what they were doing, but I wanted to know for particularly for a child with autism, how is she relating to her peers? What was going on? And I really felt I had to have another conversation. Mm. And I felt the same way about IEP meetings. I would be happy for her to be a part of a lot of them because I do believe in that phrase, not about me without me. Yes. But for instance, my granddaughter, who was like, I guess what's now a level one autism, um, she was still scoring in the eighth grade at a 2.9 level in her reading. Mm -hmm. However, she was reading and comprehending and doing work much more difficult than that. But she was savvy enough that I was afraid that she would understand those scores, ask what it meant, and that she wouldn't truly understand that that was probably an effect of her autism on answering the questions or do you know what I mean? So yeah. There was like information. Yeah, and so I would be saying that one of the challenges is if there's something that needs to be discussed, whether it's, and I would say conflict without anger, but just conflict. Yeah. There are some things the child does not need to be a part Absolutely. of. Absolutely. There are some things the child should be a part of, mm -hmm. even with conflict. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's just the pros is you can never start too early mm -hmm. to have them involved in that self-determination. But I think we do have to make choices about conversations they don't have to be a part of. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really well said. Thank you. I know y'all had something you wanted to share. So one of the things we commented on was um, many families that I worked with were like, I don't want him to go to that meeting or her to go to that meeting and hear all of those negative things. Yeah. And, and Greg reinforced the idea of it's supposed to be a positive, you know, based upon strength. You know, the model should be strength based and acknowledge the challenges, but the strength based piece of that is so critically important. Yeah. So in our state, we started um, playing around with, you know, appreciative inquiry as a focus for the IUP meeting. Mm -hmm. Be focusing on and, you know, shifting the conversation from deficit problem to uh, objectives, not missing the fact that we need to work on right. the gap. But let's also have the student clear. Yeah. What are we trying to achieve here? Yeah. Starting with strengths, addressing needs, but not emphasizing and being careful about how we, you know, report scores. I'll never, I sat in an IEP meeting with a mom what, years ago and um, as a behavior analyst and I was, I was there kind of to support her. And I remember, I remember very quickly that her eyes just went and it was right at the beginning when they said that her six-year-old was, re, was, was, uh, developmentally at a four month old level. And that's all she heard. Right. I knew that's all she heard. Yeah. And afterwards I was like, how are you? What's, what's going on? And she was like, all I kept thinking is that my new six month old niece knows more than my child. And that was heartbreaking for her. Yeah. I'm really struck 
what was the purpose of saying that? So that's exactly. So one thing we do in our, and this all, I'm glad you asked that question. So to this point, all of this needs to be taught to teachers on how to do it. You can't just say, have your students lead it. They need to know how to have their students lead it. And they need to know how to run an IEP. And that is telling them, you may have norm language. Don't use that. Talk about criteria. Talk about what he's doing at that. They don't need to do that. But for some reason, and I, I cannot answer that question other than I think a lot of preparation programs, it, I think just get in the habit of read the raw scores and just and they don't realize the weight that it brings. And it doesn't give you any information. What does that tell the parent? Nothing, nothing. But it also seems to be about, again, the teachers showing that they have a level of competence, that they can read the scores, they can report on the scores, they have a, a kind of expertise that yes. they need to, and the extent to which you can work with educators to say that the expertise lies elsewhere. That the expertise can be equally valuable when it when it comes to talking about how to meet needs, then that's I think what could be helpful. Right, and I mean I cannot say this enough. We we just we need to do trainings, and they can't just be one year one time a year. We need to have coaching trainings ongoing on how to have these meaningful conversations with families, and if and if we're going to do student and how can we involve the student at whatever level? I, I completely agree with Joanne. At any at any age, they can be there and involved. How do they, how does that look? It can differentiate, you know. So it can all look different. But you know, everyone shared the idea that I heard self determination a lot. Having students really understand who they are, what they want, how they believe and, and their identity really. Um, but being careful of how we do that, we don't want to hurt hurt them in the process with, but that deficit language, we need to do that training ahead of time and say, no, that just, that that shouldn't, the parents shouldn't even be worried about that because the teacher shouldn't even be doing that behavior. You know what I mean? So it's really doing that. But then also, um, and, and that self-determination is really important and really understanding themselves. As a college professor, I, I've had multiple times where students have come up to me, undergraduates, and they've handed me an IEP. And they've said, I have an IEP and, and these, and I'm like, they, how did, you know, how did, wow, well, no, my parent gave me this and they told me to bring it and give it to you guys and that you guys will help us with accommodations. And it was like, oh my gosh, we failed these kids what? because they really, really are going in not having the advocacy skills. I'm an edu, I mean, they're, I'm an edu, I'm a special educator. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll send you the disability access services. This is how you do it. Let me help you do it. But if they go into like a business yeah, class where the, they don't have yeah. any modifications or they don't know how to accommodate, then you're really not, that, that student's kind of lost. Yes. Thank you for that. That's right. Yeah. I think it's really important that self-determination from the time they're little, uh -huh. because while students with disabilities are students first, they seem to, at least my granddaughter, was slower to understand than maybe some other kids. I think all kids go through struggles, but I think she is still at 23 struggling to figure out who she is with autism. Yeah. And I think the more that they can be a part of that and talk about it and their needs, I think it has so much better for them once they reach transition, once they reach what they want to be in life, because they've got to know who they are and explore possibilities before transition. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Like round of applause there. And along with that self-determination curriculum, I really, I mean, I know there's so much fire under this, which I find absolutely ridiculous, but social emotional learning has got to take place with, with all of our students from the very beginning so that they're able to know how they're feeling, how they're identifying. I mean, so much of that comes with having, and then they grow up, hopefully, you know, that's our goal, right? They grow up to be successful citizens in our society. That's, that's the goal. It's not just to check the boxes of IDA and make sure we do the annual IEP every year. We want to make sure that when they are transitioned, they have those skills and, and at least a direction to go, you know? So Great. emphasis on teachers, parents, and the student, parents interchangeably with families, community members, friends, anyone that can come to the meeting. And, and student facilitated IEP meetings can look different across 
I've been working with my colleague, um, Lori Peterson, who does a lot on self-determination, that's her background, um, on sort of bridging my background with facilitated IEPs and her background with, with student um, with self-determination to create this student facilitated IEP curriculum. But what we've realized is that there needs to be this really large continuum. Yeah. Right. Like it, it could be presenting a little bit. It could be and it might change over time. Um, but the overall idea is let's not forget who the most important person is on this. In this process, mm -hmm. and let's not forget to include their voice and having their voice. One time um, I was doing a training and one of the educators gave such a good example of, of having the student voice at the table. She said we were having this long conversation and the mom the mother was very adamant that this that her son goes to community college um, to get a, a business degree. And the son really liked to cook and he really wanted to be a chef. And he was like, I don't want to go to school. And so and he had good self. He had that self-determination. And, uh, you know, as a behavior, sometimes they try to say, oh, they're doing this, that. And I'm like, that's not a behavior problem. That's called self-determination. They're just telling you what they want to do. Let's not forget we're all humans, right? We have some autonomy just because you have a disability doesn't mean you don't get to make up your own mind, my goodness. Um, but yeah, so they talked to the parent a little bit more and the student was really adamant. And then they found out really conflict. Talk about not knowing the, the mother was really sad because she always wanted to go to college and didn't. This was yeah. a her issue really. And so honestly, during the team discussion, it started out with, why don't you go back to school, take some community college classes? And she did. And they were like, okay. And then it kind of got off the boat, but they listened to the parent and they listened to the student and they kind of listened to them together. So that's a good example of everyone coming together. Absolutely. So what we talked about, it helps them be self-determined. It's an important part of preparing our students for involvement as a citizen, our society. And everyone can benefit from the student sharing their knowledge. Sometimes we don't like the knowledge they share, but they should share that knowledge. You know, and I always say, be careful what you ask a student if you're not ready for that answer. You might get an answer you don't want, um, but it's important that we do. And, and that we, I always say, quick Q-tip, quit taking it personal. It's not about you. Oh, it's not about you. So um, that's kind of a good rule of thumb. Okay. So... Another strategy that we want to make sure that um, our IEP team leaders are um, looking at our culturally responsive practices. We talk, we've talked in a lot of other sessions about this, um, but understanding, I think the, the first step in this is understanding what the barriers are. For me, you know, as an educator, um, I remember being, you know, a young special ed teacher having no earthly idea how to run an IEP team meeting, honestly, just secretly hoping that the parents wouldn't show up. Uh, but I was coming from a very different cultural background than my students were and then, than the parents of my students. And it took me a long time to understand you know, better ways to communicate with my parents and make them feel comfortable. Um, and, and we know these issues. Our, our great speaker um, this morning, was it this morning? Oh, I'm getting all the speakers it's all, all blending. Mixed up. But yeah, it was this morning. Um, talked about some of these, uh, just that general, um, those areas of inequity, um, unrealistic expectations that um, either the families or the schools can have. Um, lack of cultural responsiveness of the of the whole school system, which can be a, a big barrier. Uh, I'm not going to just read off of this entire list for you, but, you, but the, um, does anybody have some examples of situations where you know that this has been a barrier in IEP team meetings and how maybe you've overcome that or that you've seen staff overcome those barriers. I think we all, and it's almost hard to identify specifically. It's kind of like a broad systemic. Did you want to share something? So, so again, from Washington, Seattle area, uh, there's a zip code south of Seattle that for a while had more languages spoken than anyone in the United States, like 131 languages. But there's a group called Open Doors for Multicultural and Linguistically Diverse Families. 
they are a phenomenal resource Love in that. addressing these challenges. Say and that again. What's the it's resource? Open doors. Open doors for multi for multicultural and linguistically diverse families. It's for multicultural and diverse families. Yeah, supporting them to access this, I and mean, they bring parents in from those communities: Ukrainian, Somali, Chinese, whatever. Training them high level of training and skills to support yeah. those families. That's amazing. So it's a unique resource, but it's they're really amazing. And we need resources like that because, like the district that's near my university, there's languages where they don't have families have languages they don't have any interpreter available. And it's a different dialect, and so they're 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 you know relying on computer programs, and it just it's really challenging. So any kind of resources or agencies that have support is huge. Yeah, really important. And the, so I did want to note the you know our documents that we send home, our procedural safeguards. I think most states have been working on looking at the reading level of their procedural safeguards and they are usually at a graduate school reading level and uh, you know bringing those down to a normal person reading level and this is a constant thing that you know that i have to continue to remember um just in my own practice is working in in the community of um, families with disabilities where I live and I'm partnering with the, the housing authority on a project right now, unrelated to special education, but I um, talked to the director about well you know I, I have an opportunity for a grant that we can you know provide some parent resources for all the parents that live in this housing you know um, development and you know I just had like all these thoughts that we would put together all these great resources for these families and we could do a you know parent night once a month and train them on this and she said you know Amy <laughs> that's great and I appreciate your enthusiasm but that's not really what they need they need advocates they need parent advocates that can go with them to meetings i'm like aha okay you know that was you know me forgetting to find out culturally what does that community need instead of me thinking what i assume they need so it's you know it's a constant learning process that we're in it's not boom i'm culturally responsive <laughs> and you don't have to keep working on it all the time um so we talked about equitable collaboration, looking at these four big components, the roles that we play, the goals of our communication, the strategies we use and the change processes. So this idea that in our roles, we have to kind of um, work at leveling that playing field um, with our families, shifting our goals um, i'm sorry i'm <laughs> forgetting what i'm talking about that's okay um, shifting the way that we think about what the goals of our our um, processes are like tracy mentioned the goal is not to get through graduation with every single iep done on time and timeline but for the student to be able to um meet those expectations the the hopes and dreams that the families have for the child you know when they start kindergarten and then we use you know our strategies that that we learn for building those relationships and understanding that this change process takes time and this yeah. comes from the um, a really great resource, Equitable Collaboration. Uh, it's by the authors Ishimaru, and it's it's she's very focused on. Um, I think meeting families where they're at is also from Beth Harry. That's also a really good book where they really lay out strategies for educators that can build equitable collaboration. So in, in her work, recognizing that a lot of the ways that we've been in trying to involve culturally diverse families or language diversity or whatever diversity um, is, is very much from a white educated perspective, right. Yeah, exactly. right? So it's like, hey, come to school with us, come learn where that maybe not doesn't work with their family, their, their background, their everything. That's not how learning occurs. So yes. connecting them with other families, connecting them with 
um, other resources, you spoke about that, having a cultural broker, someone there who understands the language, understands the culture, understands the perspective can be there as a support agent for the family okay. and as a service, as a resource um, for that. We have about five. Minutes. Okay, so, so let's go. I'm getting distracted trying to zoom fast. So again, we want to talk about what happens before the meeting, what happens during the meeting, and what happens after the meeting. Meeting with parents beforehand, explaining in a way that is understandable to you know your audience, their rights, what's involved in the whole process. I liked that idea of, of pairing a, a new incoming family with a family with I some experience that. in the process. Such a great idea. Um, meeting with an interpreter beforehand to make sure that the interpreter knows you know, what's going to be talked about, that they're not caught off guard. Um, and then during the meeting, you know, having all the team members introducing themselves and what their role is. However, I do have to say, I hate it when I hear people going around the table introducing themselves, or maybe the facilitators introducing people like, well, this is Mr. So-and-so, the principal, and this is Mr. Smith, the teacher, and then, and this is mom. Like, what? <laughs> That's that is very. I don't like it when anyone calls me mom unless they're my child. Unless you're my child, yeah. I know. Like, it's very weird. Yeah. And and paying attention to nonverbal cues as well as the verbal cues um, after the meeting. That follow up is really important with parents. I liked one of the sessions I went to with the the SIVA, which is a parent um, volunteer ad advocacy program. Um, that the the volunteer advocate does a follow up with the parent after the meeting to make sure that everything is um, understood. Yeah, it's on the same note, but I had a district who they would have a member of the IEP team call the parent once a week for six weeks after the IEP meeting, just to assess how are we doing. Wow. And they said most of the time by the third week the parents say we're fine. Don't call me anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But they were being proactive and they were being, being proactive. proactive. And so that goes to Joanne's point about the time, right? A lot of times you're like, but I don't have the time for the pre-meeting and all that. If I could figure out if we, this is my, I'm trying to find this answer. If we could keep track of how much time educators are spending putting out fires that could be otherwise avoided by having these prevention meetings, we would have a strong argument to say, yes, I know it's a lot of time now, but trust me, you're going to save a lot of time later and probably money and alcohol or whatever you need to get through what's happening right yeah. like a lot of, of stress and all that's going to be taken and away just providing a written summary of the meeting you get that you know 32 page iep document with the font that's like size eight uh, nobody's going to read that nobody understands that but and i worked with a teacher one time that she would then send home with the family a nice little one pager that was just a broad explanation of what they had decided on what had happened and with contact information if they had questions so we'll go into the last one but i have one thing i have to add cuz i i heard it last night i was hanging out with the ohio parent coalition uh, the pti there they're doing great work and i was so excited to hear that the department of ed is partnering with them for them to redo the procedural safeguards in oh. family friendly language yeah. it's a partnership with the pti and the department of ed and i thought that's amazing because then we have right um i wish they were here to give them but i said i want to hear about how that goes and i just love that openness so if you are from a you know a department of ed and you're thinking how could i do something that's maybe a way to make your parent um, have an information that goes along with it or something to make those rights not a requirement that we're handing out but something they legitimately understand yeah yeah so last but not least, we have no time left to talk about this, oh. but um, I do want to mention the idea of restorative practices. Um, do you want me to go to the next one? Yeah, just go to the next one. Yeah, so what are restorative practices? They're based on those principles and processes that um, really key into the, the importance of that positive relationship and restoring relationships after they've occurred. We've heard a few speakers talk about this family professional partnership is a marriage that you can't get out of. It's like you are stuck, whether you it move. is a good one or not. So repairing 
the relationship after conflict has occurred, we can use restorative practices to, to help us on that road. And the, the point of restorative practices are that you're developing a community that can manage conflict and tensions by building relationships on the front end. And that's really the idea is that you have to build those relationships on the front end and then re repairing harm on the back end. Why do we want to use them? Well, of course, if you have gone through a formal dispute resolution process, there are a lot of unresolved feelings, both on the school side and the family side, feelings of hurt and anger and betrayal. Um, when I've interviewed teachers about this process, they, they really feel hurt, you know, like at, in their heart that the parent you know, filed a complaint or, or filed a due process. Not to not to mention all the the hurt and struggle that's happening on the family side, um, and the team is going to you know really struggle to rebuild this relationship. But they you know it's so important that they do. Um, teachers can contribute to this healing process, the healing of the relationship, if they are consciously using restorative practices. And of course, they can prevent conflict from escalating as well. I've done whole entire conference presentations on this one topic, so it's, it's we're not doing it justice right here. Um, key elements are communication, building that mutual understanding, understanding that both sides have a common goal, um, respecting individuals and empowering um, empowerment and equality, focusing on that collaborative decision-making. So a lot of the things we talked about so far have focused on that collaborative decision-making making, and meeting your obligations, both sides following through on what they said they were gonna do is very important. And it really is a very systematic process. If you are following a certain restorative practice procedure, there is a system to it. I love this quote. This is a, from some of my research and it was actually not from an education journal publication, but from a legal publication that there is a longstanding consensus that very few, if any, disputes, even divorce, involve greater emotional tension than a parent. It makes me get a little choked up when I read it. <laughs> the rest of it. Then a parent, I'm going to, now I'm, I'm <laughs> then a parent's desires and attempts to secure adequate educational programs and services for their child. It makes me really choked up when I read yeah. that. I read it to my students and they see me get a little mucklimped. <laughs> but anyway, and I think that's just important for us to remember that our parents aren't coming to us trying to be difficult or trying to be mean, but this is their, you know, at their core, the most emotional thing that they will probably go through in their lives. Oh, yeah, go back to that. So hopefully this was helpful for you all. We didn't want to, we would never try to say we're going to teach you all these five strategies in an hour and a half. But the intent of this was to say there are things we can do right now to make IEP meetings better for families, for educators, for students. And just thinking outside the box sometimes, borrowing literature, looking at other fields. You know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of looking at the medical field, the business field to see how do they have productive outcomes? How do they have those meetings? Because there's a lot of moving parts to their processes as well. So, you know, looking outside, asking each other, but knowing there are things we can do to make the IEP meeting process better. And knowing that, again, it's a before, during, and after. It's always, and it's a continuum. And to the trust point that you made earlier, trust is it, it, very cyclical. You, you build, you hopefully maintain, but sometimes you repair and, and you go again. But trust is at that center. And the more you show families and students the, your commitment and your meaningful participation as a partner, the greater the outcome for that student. So that's what we hope you all got. Any questions?